feel your skin from within. Depixin helps keep you one step ahead of eczema with clearer skin and less itch. Hide my skin? Not me. Don't use if you're allergic to Dupixin. Serious allergic reactions can occur, including anaphylaxis, which is severe. Tell your doctor about new or worsening eye problems, such as eye pain or vision changes, or a parasitic infection. If you take asthma medicines, don't change or stop them without talking to your doctor. Ask your doctor about Dupixin. From framing Britney to Janet's malfunction, inside the new documentary, zeroing in on the Jackson backlash following that infamous Super Bowl halftime show. Her career suffered because of someone whose ego was hurt. Happening now. After 20 months, the U.S.-Mexico border is finally open to non-essential travelers. How that affects us in San Antonio, next. Also along the border, there's a new effort to keep migrants from crossing illegally. We are live in Eagle Pass, where the state of Texas is now using shipping containers to block the border. How that's affecting the community. I'll be back to get you ready for one of the coldest nights of the foreseeable future and a look ahead to what could be an active pattern next week. See you in a bit. The News at 5 starts right now. And first at five, we are beginning with our border coverage today. Stefania Jimenez and Alicia Barrera both making the trip down to the southern border. Stefania in Laredo, where there's a sense of normalcy returning there now that it's finally open to non-essential travelers. That bridge is thousands of Mexican citizens crossing the border for quick day trips. Stefania joins us now with a look at how things are going down there. Well, Stephen Ursula, the activity here is really nonstop. It's a 24-7 operation. We've got tens of thousands of people really crossing the bridge from Nuevo Laredo across the border to come here into Laredo. And some of them are waiting even two hours, standing in line for two hours in order to be able to cross the bridge. A huge difference from what we've seen for the last 21 months when all of this was really just limited to essential travel. Uh, we're talking about those are people who were involved with things like trade, huge trucks that used to come over to bring goods from Mexico. But now you're also having people who are coming here as tourists, shoppers, uh, and they're also coming here to visit their family members. And this is a huge deal because like us, you have to keep in mind that a lot of the people, the non-essential travelers, were cooped up during the pandemic, just like us. So now they're just relieved to finally be able to cross the border. Listen. Pues muy bien, ya tenía mucho tiempo que quería venir. Las cosas es mejor calidad, la tela o algo. Hay más ofertas, siento que hay más ofertas y rinde, para mí me rinde más el dinero aquí y compro de mejor calidad. We have seen since November 8 that we resume our travel operations for non-essential purposes for fully vaccinated travelers. We've seen an increase of 60% in our pedestrians and over 30% in our vehicle passengers. What does that translate to when it comes to rough numbers? How many thousands of people a day, do you know? Approximately, we're back to operating and processing uh, almost 15,000 vehicles and over 8,000 pedestrians, uh, over 30,000 passengers uh, daily. Okay, so the impact of that is kind of a mixed bag. So what you heard from there from the Customs and Border Protection is all the traffic that they're getting here now that they've started to get just within the last 10 days that they have been able to reopen the border. But hold on, because Black Friday, as we all know, is next week. And we just told you that some people are waiting in line here for two hours could be up to four hours next week when Black Friday comes around. But this is the other side to this. This doesn't necessarily benefit the businesses here in Laredo because a lot of them were shut down during the pandemic. So what does that mean? It's actually good news for San Antonio because a lot of the people who you see here are going to drive an extra two hours into San Antonio in order to visit our businesses there. Steve. 35,000 people a day coming across that bridge. Amazing. All right, Stephanie, mm -hmm. we're seeing a lot of differences, though, along the southern border. It's not all quite the same, is it? No, definitely not. So our colleague Alicia Barrera is uh, live for us in Eagle Pass, where she's talking about Governor Greg Abbott there, who set up shipping containers to plug holes along the border to prevent undocumented immigrants from coming in. So the concern there is really more about border security, whereas here it's commerce up in Eagle Pass. It is border security. And we're going to send things on over to our colleague Alicia Barrera, who is live in Eagle Pass with that part of the story. Alicia. 
Stefania, well, really, these shipping containers have been the talk of the town. People swinging by really just to snap a picture. And they haven't even been here that long. And although those who live in Eagle Pass say, yeah, it's a bit of an eyesore. This is really a park where kids come to play. They are on board with what the state of Texas is doing, really under the leadership of Governor Greg Abbott. So you get a better idea. There are about 20 shipping containers containers that stretch along the Texas side of the Rio Grande, and they pass directly under the Eagle Pass Piedras Negras International Bridge. So you get a better idea of how much it covers. The row of containers is actually longer than a football field. And a big question from people in Eagle Pass is who put these here and why? Well, again, it's under the leadership of the governor of Texas that DPS and the Texas Military Department have partnered for Operation Steel Curtain. The shipping containers or steel containers were placed here yesterday. And today we've only seen soldiers from the Texas National Guard patrol this area. But another tactic, part of the operation is barbed wire and all of this to, quote, block and repel criminal activity and stop violations of state law. That's according to DPS. And those who live here in Eagle Pass, they say this is okay. They are on board. There's been a steady flow of curious people who at first say it's tough to believe there's even heavy military presence here or that boxes could stop undocumented undocumented immigrants. However, however, once they see it for themselves, they say they're pleased. We have soldiers even stationed here, um, so they're, we're well protected. But uh, if they come by force and everything, yes, they can cross over. So now we wait and see what's going to go on because uh, we have the defense. We have the soldiers protecting us here, so we're okay. Well, they didn't have to wait too long to see some activity happen here at the border. Border Patrol was able to catch and detain a family of five undocumented immigrants just a few hours ago. And I asked one of the agents exactly where they caught up with this group. And it was just west of where we're standing in the middle of the Rio Grande. That family's clothing was wet. They were shivering. They were soaked. And they seemed a little confused. And again, this was this all happening right behind where we were standing, all unfolding. And again, although the plan is to deter families of undocumented immigrants. That family of five was able to get through. So at this point, it's truly too early to know exactly if Operation Steel Front will work. But again, troops are standing by. Stefania? Well, I'll take it from here. Thank you guys so much. Great work on the border, Alicia Barrera and Stefania Jimenez. We're going to continue our team coverage along the U.S.-Mexico border, and we're going to bring it to you at 6 and 10 tonight. You can stay up to date with everything that's going on down there on our website, ksat.com. Just click on the border tab under the news section of the homepage, or you can type ksat.com slash border, but be sure to use lowercase alphabet. It's your weather news at five. San Antonio police need help finding this man. They say he's wanted for aggravated sexual assault. The assault happened October 15th on the west side. Police say it involves two underage girls. They want to find this guy. The suspect believed to be driving a BMW sedan. If you have any information, call SAPD at 210-207-2313. San Antonio police and Crime Stoppers asking for your help to solve a murder that happened more than 10 years ago. Jeff Freeman was killed in broad daylight on October 11th, 2011 on Fredericksburg Road, north of downtown. His death, though, ruled a homicide and police are still asking for help with any clues or information about this murder. They want you to call 210-224-STOP. Any information that leads to an arrest could lead to a $5,000 reward. A San Antonio police officer put behind bars today after he allegedly lied about a crash investigation. Officer Morgan Lucas suspended without pay on Tuesday. Lucas is charged with tampering with a government record, an indictment accusing him of uh, right, rather accuses him of writing a false police report about a 2019 crash. That indictment says Lucas wrote in the report that he ran the vehicle's license plates and identified the suspect that had warrants and that he did not chase the suspect. Authorities now believe those statements weren't accurate. The driver in the pursuit allegedly struck a car, a police car. Lucas has been with the department since 2016.
We are now in day three of deliberations in the Kyle Rittenhouse trial. The 18 year old facing five charges in all regarding the shooting deaths of two people during a protest in Kenosha, Wisconsin last year. A third person also wounded. Today, the county sheriff is asking people to remain peaceful during and after deliberations. Yesterday, the jury asked the judge if it could review drone video showing Rittenhouse's demeanor during that protest. The defense is arguing Rittenhouse acted in self-defense. They've even requested a mistrial twice. The verdict could be reached at any moment now. Of course, we'll bring it to you as soon as we have an update. And we're feeling the differences outside today. You know, this time yesterday we were around 80 degrees. Right now we're a little closer to 60. So we're talking about a 20 degree temperature drop compared to yesterday. Our official high temperature today so far 70. Our low earlier this morning 57, but that's going to be corrected by midnight. I think will be cooler than that. So that climate data is very preliminary for today. Temperatures right now. Mostly in the lower 60s, but 59 in Bernie. As we go through the evening, it's going to cool off. We'll talk about how cold and where in just a bit. All right, Adam, thanks very much. Taking a look at uh, I-35 and Loop 410, some slow traffic there on the east side of 35. So normally seeing uh, that back up uh, this time of day. So uh, keep that in mind if you're heading out on the east side today and taking a look at 35 of northeast 22 minutes. Also seeing some crashes and delays on the south side at I-37, Loop 1604. Steve, first look. I'll take it, Sam. Undergrads feeling unsettled at UTSA. I'm Myra Arthur with a look ahead to what we're working on for 6 o'clock. Someone stole a master key to dorm rooms at UTSA, then made their way inside several of them. But they didn't just take that key. They stole belongings from those dorms, too. Our Jeffany Gray covering the story for us. She explains how this happened and what the university is doing about it right now. Plus, Thanksgiving a week away now, a big difference from last year to this year. People are vaccinated. Coming up at 6 o'clock, we're talking to a pediatric infectious disease doctor about the risk of COVID-19 in kids right now and what she's seen in children as young as five years old who have now received that vaccine. That's what we're working on. Those stories and more coming your way at 6 o'clock. We'll send it back to you in the studio, Ursula. Thank you, Myra. Now, if the pandemic puts you behind on your water and light bill, there is some help for you. City Council just approving $30 million to forgive overdue saws and CPS energy accounts. That money will be used to forgive overdue balances from a 19 month period between March of 2020 and September of this year. Depending on your income level, you could either get your entire balance cleared or get a credit of up to $700 for saws and up to $1,000 for CPS. You do need to go directly through the utilities to apply, and you'll have to be part of their affordability programs or on a payment plan. You also have to show you have been negatively affected by COVID. You know, maybe they lost their job, um, they were on unemployment, um, some other factor, significant medical bills, other things that we can point back to COVID. Um, we just want to make sure that we've got the documentation in place to uh, substantiate eligibility for the ARPA funding. The $30 million won't cover all of what customers owe the two utilities. The city's still debating how to spend the rest of its federal dollars and could put more to utility relief later on. The holidays almost here, and whether you're carving a turkey or cutting a pie, you need the right tools, starting with a good knife. Which one deserves a chef's kiss next? And if you're looking for a way to give back this holiday season, the Salvation Army could use your help. They need volunteers for their Red Kettle campaign. How you can help, up next. The Salvation Army gearing up for its annual Red Kettle campaign, which raises money to help fund its year round initiatives. This year, they're facing a shortage of bell ringers. The Red Kettle campaign kicks off tomorrow officially. It runs through December 24th. The organization wants to make sure every site is staffed every day. There are volunteer opportunities and paid positions as well. If you're interested in volunteering, head to SalvationArmySATX.org. Click on the register to ring tab. You can also call. 210-352-2000. Well, the holidays right around the corner, a time when even novice cooks get into the kitchen. Something that's a big help, a good knife. Maybe you even have a home chef on your shopping list. Well, 12 on your side's Marilyn Moritz shows, shows us which knives tested the best. 
When you're taking meat, veggies, and herbs from fridge to feast, there's one tool a cook can't do without. A good chef's knife can make chopping, slicing, and dicing a lot easier. Prices range a lot, so how do you pick? Consumer Reports tested 8-inch chef knives from Henkel's, Wusthof, Mac, KitchenAid, Global, Xylus, Kemake, and Mercer. First check, ergonomics. So a knife with a well-designed handle allows the user to do more work, become less tired in the course of doing that work, and decreases the likelihood of accidents. Next, CR's Paul Hope, who's also a trained chef, actually used the knives in his home kitchen. The hardest things you can do in a kitchen is to work with raw chicken. So I used each knife for that and to prep a variety of veggies. Which ones cut it best? Testers say this Henkel's Premio 8-inch chef's knife seems to fit every hand, and the contoured handle is comfortable to grip. And the weight of the blade feels just right, about $40. For the best classic design, the heftier Wusthof Classic 8-inch has a traditional design. The blade is a single piece of steel that runs from tip to handle, $150. Their best budget pick? This KitchenAid Classic Forged 8-inch Triple Rivet Chef Knife. Although it's not made of carbon steel, the blade cuts easily and only $20. Good knives are an investment, so you want to take care of them. First of all, don't store them loose in a drawer and don't put them in the dishwasher. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. I think I just broke two rules. Well, I, think, I think those are good picks any way you cut it. Yeah. Hey, uh, <laughs> live cam outside, 62 degrees. This is what I'm talking about to get me in the yeah. holiday spirit. This is beard weather for us that are doing now no shave Now you can November. handle it, right? Yeah. Marissa thought you said this is beer weather. I was like, well, yeah. yeah well, <laughs> maybe. That's yes, kind of beard weather as well. Itchy beard weather. What, is your <laughs> wife, what does your wife think about the beard? That is my big question. Okay. She likes the way it looks. She just doesn't want it close to her. Oh. Like the scruffiness. So, yeah. At least you look good. There you go. You got that going <laughs> He's fuzzy you. like a teddy bear. <laughs> Feeling the chill tonight. Good beard weather tonight and tomorrow morning. You'll want the jacket to start uh, the day tomorrow. Warmer weekend, but it's going to be brief and then rain possible into next week by Thanksgiving. So let's get right to it. Take a look outside. We've got the clouds still lingering overhead, but we are expecting them to break up later this evening. That will help our temperatures take a bit of a dive later tonight, at least locally, not everywhere. We'll get into the specifics in a moment. 62 right now, dew point of 36, that dry air is in place and the wind gusting up to 22 miles per hour. So still a bit breezy outside, not as gusty as earlier today, but it's still noticeable. Temperatures across the state look very fall like for the most part, 50s and 60s across the Lone Star State. Pleasanton 67, meanwhile, 57 in Kerrville. 57 in Fredericksburg and Rock Springs right now at 55. Del Rio, where Stephanie is, or actually she's in Laredo, right? Laredo? Mm -hmm. Stephanie is in Laredo. Laredo, 62 degrees for her. Del Rio, meanwhile, at 64. This is what it's going to look like early tomorrow morning. Have your jackets ready. Hill Country, 30s, about 38, 39 in Kerrville, Fredericksburg, and Rock Springs. 44 here in San Antonio, but notice closer to 50 along the border. I expect the clouds to linger overhead along the Rio Grande and surrounding communities overnight. That's going to act as an insulator and kind of a blanket, so not quite as cool along the Rio Grande. But Lackland area, 46. Leon Springs tomorrow morning, 41. New Braunfels, 43, along with Lavernia and Bernie, 39 to start your day tomorrow. So feeling the chill tomorrow morning. Our low temperatures will still be on the cool side Saturday to start the day. By Sunday, a little resurgence of humidity. It's our brief little warm up in terms of the morning temperatures closer to 60 degrees. Temperatures or winds right now out of the northeast at 10 to 20, but starting to calm down. They'll continue to dissipate and calm down through the night and into the day tomorrow. We had some showers south of San Antonio, actually where we need the moisture and still some ongoing rain where we need it southwest of town, Maverick County and neighboring counties as well, closer to I-35. But that's going to continue to dissipate through the evening. Wound up system that gave us our cold front, it's over Canada, moving eastward. And here's our overall weather pattern. Pretty quiet here through the weekend and into the early part of next week. Sunday, disturbance far to the north gives us a weak cold front. But next week, our focus shifts to the Pacific. Two disturbances coming together Monday, Tuesday. And then right now, it looks like those could drop into northern Mexico by Thanksgiving. That would favor an active weather pattern 
by Thanksgiving of next week. So we've got rain chances back in the forecast then. Temperatures falling through the 50s this evening. Less wind out there. 44 to start the day tomorrow. But remember, cooler, especially in the hill country. 67 by the afternoon. We'll have a lot of sunshine tomorrow with temperatures well into the 60s. By Saturday, highs in the 70s. Sunday near 80. And I mentioned some scattered showers back in the forecast by Thanksgiving. We'll keep you updated because that will be changing and we'll be fine tuning it. Oh, yeah. Everyone's watching. Thank you. All right, we have some Spurs news, but it really has nothing to do with what's happening on the court. While the Spurs are away, their boss plays here, and in fact, he's actually starting construction. We're talking about managing partner Peter Holt, along with a whole host of dignitaries today, starting construction on their brand-new training facility, part of that $500 million complex. And what is the biggest challenge for the Dallas D this week? I think we all know. <laughs> Coming up. As our San Antonio Spurs wrap up their three-game road trip tonight in Minnesota, back here at home, the Spurs' top brass is on hand for groundbreaking ceremonies on their new Spurs state-of-the-art performance center. It's all part of a $500 million legacy project called the Rocket Lock and Terra, as in pounding the rock that will extend across 45 acres and feature Human Performance Research Center, a 22-acre park, a public outdoor event center, and medical hospitality and office use. Today's ceremony officially opened phase one of the project, which is the Spurs Performance Center. Having a foundation and a place where players can come and be their best self and reach their potential is what we have to have. It's table stakes now to compete. And so having this uh, will absolutely ensure that our legacy of winning continues. As far as the game is concerned, 7 p.m. tip time. Highlights for you tonight on the Night Beat. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. After the Dallas defense kept the Falcons' offense out of the end zone in the 43-3 route of Atlanta last week, the Dallas D will have a much bigger challenge this Sunday when they travel to Kansas City to take on the Chiefs. Like the Cowboys, the Chiefs possess one of the most talented quarterbacks in the league who's already thrown for almost 3,000 yards this season to go along with his 25 touchdowns in just 10 games. Rookie defensive star Micah Parsons, who already has six sacks this season, knows what he's up against. Patrick Mahomes' ability just to get outside the pocket and extend plays, I mean, he just makes it so challenging for you to cover the whole field. And uh, he's pretty aware of the weapons he got, so he's just trying to give him extra time to get open. So it's important that we got all 11 guys stand on their key and get into the ball. All right, meantime, the Houston Texans are going to snap out of their eight-game losing streak. And they're going to have to be the best team in the AFC and their division rivals, the Tennessee Titans, are 8-2. and two. And in order to have a shot at that, quarterback Tyrod Taylor will have to have a much better game than he did against Miami, where he threw three interceptions in his first game back since he was injured in Week 2. Does he believe having at least one game under his belt will help against the Titans? I believe so. Uh, obviously, last outing um, in Miami wasn't... Um, a winning, a winning one or opportunity to give the offense a chance to go out and put up points. Um, definitely something to clean up and watch it with a critical eye. I um, had the bye week to also work on some things and uh, looking forward to getting back on the field this week and bouncing back personally, but uh, also as a team. Good luck to the Texans. And besides the Spurs tonight, we'll have big game playoff coverage on Thursday night for you. Absolutely. Thank you, Greg. Yeah. We'll be right back. Definitely a chill in the air again tomorrow morning. We'll see readings in the 40s and 50s and as, even 30s as we get into the hill country. Tomorrow afternoon, though, 60s. Thanks, Adam, and thank you for watching the News at 5. See you back here at 6. World News is next.